Eric, sit down. Good evening. Welcome to our discussion series, Stories, Lies, and Disinformation, with WNMU Distinguished Visitor, Nina Burley. WNMU's President's Distinguished Visitor Series is a new program for celebrated scholars to visit our campus and community for extended stays and to interact with students, the university community, and the public. I am so pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Nina Burley to you all this evening. Nina is a journalist and author of seven books. That's a total understatement. <laughs> Just go to, go to ninaburley.com and you can read for hours about all that she has done. She's also a dog owner, a mother, and a cyclist. You may, in fact, have seen her cycling around town or on various trails in the area, and I think she's a little competitive. <laughs> Tonight, Nina will be presenting part one of this two-part series, Mass Media and U.S. Politics from the Printing Press to Facebook. She will share her background in her work as a journalist and help us better understand the transition of the media's coverage of U.S. politics from print to the World Wide Web. Before handing the podium over to Nina, I would like to recognize those who helped to make this evening possible. Many thanks to Alexandra Tager and the at WNMU Cultural Affairs team for organizing this night, tonight's event. Yay, Alex. We'd also like to thank Michael Acosta and his WNMU w Media Technology Services team for their work in the technical aspects of the event, including our Zoom room for those unable to attend in person. And now, here's Nina. Hi. Thank you, Kate, for that. Um, lavish introduction. I had told her just to say I was a cyclist, a mother, a writer, and she went a little further. Um, and thank you all for coming out on this windy night. Um, I'm just so honored to be here and so grateful to um, the university for giving me the time to uh, spend here working on some writing that I've been doing, and also to um, the various friends that I've made here in the last two months. I'm not going to point you all out, but I can see you here, and it's just been so lovely. So thank you again uh, for showing up. I was told that there might be like four people here, and I said, well, you know, I've, I've given bookstore talks where only the employees are there, and I'm totally fine with just four people coming because I can yak on about my stuff for, and, and especially this topic, to anyone who wants to listen. Um, so, the, the talk uh, that I want to give is really kind of a two-part. I'm going to start with a little mini-discussion, um, and then I'll give you some war stories. Hopefully they're fun or funny to listen to, and then we'll go back to the, um, the discussion. So the first thing... I want to ask you, and I hope a couple of you won't raise your hands, is um, what is a fact? Anybody? Something that's true. Something that's true. Anybody else? Peter? Has proven to be what? To be unchangeable. Something that over time has proven to be unchangeable. Yes. Verified by many sources. Anyone else? Two plus two equals four, is that a fact? I'm not a mathematician. It could be and it could not be. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. What we agree upon, so some opinion comes into it. Yes, sir. Uh, sort of a scientific answer, uh, something that can be verified, provable observation. Uh, anyone else? 
All right, put a pin in that. We're going to move to the next. Wait a minute. I have to. I made a little. I made a little slideshow because I just think these are fun. Okay. Everybody know what this thing is? Printing press. Um, the printing press. I was when I was thinking about. It, I was going to bringing it into this conversation. I looked it up and I learned that the printing press is actually blamed for the Thirty Years' War. Did anybody know that? Historians here? It, the, printing, the creation of the printing press changed the way that information was disseminated to such a degree that a war broke out. I never knew that. Um, so I'm not going to ask you about the printing press, but I want to know what you think the point of journalism is. What is, what is journalism for? Why do we have it? Anybody read, do you still read the news? So what is, what do you get from journalism? What do you, why do we care that it exists at all? Journalizing what's happening today. The weather. What's it going to be like? Is it going to be windy? Is that journalism? No? Yes, it is. Yes, it's information about what's going on. That's my opinion. Um, any other thoughts? We're going to come back to this, but if anybody wants to weigh in. Does it change if you put investigative in front of journalism? No? Anybody else? I think it kind of might, but journalism is, can be investigative and it can be many other things, right? Um, so I, let's put a pin in that too because we're going to come back to it. Um, now, a little bit about me and why I'm asking you these questions. Um, and I have an hour, less than an hour. I don't want to bore you. I'm going to do this for 30 minutes, and then we're going to start talking. Um, this is the Capitol building of the state of Illinois. It's in Springfield. And I started my career there a very long time ago. Um, came out of college with an English degree, thought that I was going to write novels, was working as a waitress. And one of my professors said, you know, there's this program that the University of Illinois has at the um, State House, which happened to be 30 miles east of my college, little college that's recently died because of COVID and they ran out of money. So, a little Midwestern liberal arts college. Um, and she said, you can, get, you can make money doing it. And I thought, oh, that's cool. I need money. My student loans are going to start to come in um, due. And it beats waitressing. So I went over and I applied for the program and I got in. It's called the Public Affairs Reporting Program. And it basically was an internship, a paid internship that the University of Illinois gave to about, well, at that time, 15 or 20, maybe even more, um, news outlets were based in the state house in the press room they, there was a whole like floor in the in this building this beautiful building that had these little warren this little warren of rooms and those rooms were occupied by the chicago tribune and the chicago sun times and, and local npr and and then small town newspapers all over the state of illinois had offices there like bloomington and and um, normal, there's a city called Normal actually in Illinois. And one of the great headlines, we had a lot of fun there. And one of the great headlines of the, of the day that was actually stuck on the wall of the press room was, the town names of Illinois are very funny and weird. And that'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But there was this great headline, Normal Man Marries Oblong Woman. Because there was actually a town called, there is a town called Oblong, Illinois. Um, anyway, so lots of lots of local press, and and there, there, our program, there were about 14 or 15 of us, and everybody sort of got scattered into these different um, these different offices. So some people worked for the Effingham Daily or the Bloomington Daily or the Carbondale Daily, 
and TV stations and so on. So that's where I got my start. I got lucky and got the job at the Associated Press and with, worked with three guys who were um, you know, veteran journalists and that they taught me everything about how to do, how to write journalism and how to practice it. Um, so, um, I put Abe in here because Springfield is, as you probably know, or you should know, it's where he's buried. And um, Illinois, Illinois license plates have Land of Lincoln on them. And the spring, if you drive anywhere around Springfield, you would not probably be doing that anytime soon. If you feel like going into the prairie, it's kind of nice, even though it's all planted with corn now. Um, there are these signs, you'll start seeing signs along the highway um, 55 that goes all the way down to New Orleans, the big, big interstates that say um, the Lincoln Shrines are coming up. And there's just a lot of Lincoln stuff all around Springfield. Um, and I bring him in because, well, because he was honest Abe and because, you know, we are living in this weird time right now where unbelievably there are Confederate flags actually flying within 20 miles of his, these Lincoln shrines in Illinois. Um, but I started out covering politics there and he was most, one of the most famous people from Springfield. Of course, the other famous person who came out of Springfield is Obama. So I'm very proud of my state because it gave us Lincoln and it gave us Obama. Um, but um, those guys weren't around, <laughs> obviously, when I was there. Not, Abe wasn't, and Obama hadn't come down there yet. Um, I learned so much there. And the main thing I learned was about politics and money and um, corruption and power. And you know, those are like pretty big things to be learning when you're 21 or 22 years old and English major. And the world, it was a, it was a very um, rough place. And politics, they used to say, politics ain't beanbag. You know, and there were all of these like, Roger Stone, mini Roger Stone type, like really, really s bad strategizing characters in the law, you know, in the lobbying world there. And a lot of things were going on um, in the committee hearings and money was being, you know, stolen or moved around. And, and, um, and our job, and I learned it on the job, was to keep your, you know, bloodhound nose up for the smell of corruption and like track on it and pay attention to what they were doing in these committee hearings and and write about lawmaking. Um, and it sounds really boring and some of it was really boring but it was a terrific place, a foundational place for me to get involved in journalism because I had some great teachers and everything I needed to know about Kind of, I covered a lot of law too, lawmaking and legal stuff. I covered the court there. So understanding law, and I always tell my students at NYU, like go to a state capitol, don't stay here in New York. You know, you'll learn so much about bureaucracy and government and how human beings try to organize themselves because that's what I learned there. And the, the lessons I learned there, I took all over the place. And I was able to use, you know, when I co I've covered trials in, Israel, and I covered a big trial in Italy, um, and I've had to deal with, you know, bureaucracies and, and government agencies in pla weird places, and that grounding, understanding, you know, how power works and how bureaucracies work and how human beings try to organize themselves in a democracy actually transferred a lot to a lot of other places. So that's, with that as background, um, that's how I got into journalism. And I mean, it was a real foundation in speaking truth to power, which I didn't, I wanted to do then, but it took me a long time to be able to kind of step into that role. And I try to still. Um, 
So I left, um, I left Illinois in 92 because Clinton, I was covering Clinton and that's a whole other story. But, um, but right before I left, I was working with a photographer and we decided, well, I'll back up. In our office, in the Associated Press in office in the state capitol press room, in our little tiny office, there was a giant blown up DOT map of the state of Illinois, Department of Transportation map. And it was, it was huge and every little town was, was on it. Every little town. And I used to sit there on the phone you know, this is the day we'd go, we'd be sucking down black coffee and styrofoam cups and smoking cigarettes because we had deadlines and we were, and I'd sit there with my feet up and I'd be talking to people looking at this map and these n weird names would pop out at me. Like blood, there's actually a town in Illinois called B-L-O-O-D and birds, B-I-R-D-S, um, bone gap. Um, and those are just the bees that I remember. So there were all these weirdly named towns, and I, after I left Springfield and went to Chicago, I had grabbed a photographer friend of mine, and I said, we should just go on a big tour around the state of Illinois, because look at this map. Like, what are these towns? Who, wh who lives in them? So at the time, there was a magazine called Chicago Magazine. It's like New York Magazine. I think it's still there. And they said, yeah, go do it. So we went around. And it was, um, it was a shocking experience because we went down these roads to where these towns were and we found bank buildings abandoned and schools abandoned and people living in like incredible poverty, but whole, you know, front, you know, uh, main streets all boarded up, people living in bank buildings, heating them, like old, like, 1900, you know, solid granite, you know, bank buildings. They were living in them, they had sort of camped in, they were heating them with um, wood stoves. And almost all of these little towns were like that. The schools had been abandoned, there were no more children. The towns, like some of the schools, they were using the school buildings as dump sites for tr uh, tires. Um, so we wrote, she did, my, my friend, photographer, did a, um, photo essay, and I wrote a little essay about it. And then I went on my way because I got, it, I got asked to go to Washington and cover Clinton, because I had been also going down to Little Rock for People magazine and had gotten to really know a lot about Clinton, and especially Hillary. So we left, I left, went to uh, Washington in the fall of 92, such a long time ago. And um, now I'm going to tell you a story about the Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton world. Um, does anybody know who this is? Anybody? Did you say it again? Who? No. Yes, thank you, Alexandra. It's Virginia Kelly. Virginia Kelly was a character, right? She loved Elvis. She cried when Elvis died. She was just a total character. Three wife, three, sorry, three, four, buried couple husbands. Um, Elky, I think, a lot of drinking. Um, loved makeup. This picture does not do her justice because the blue eyeshadow was the thing. Um, so there's Virginia Kelly. And um, one of the things about uh, journalism like you asked, is investigative journalism different from other kinds of journalism? Um, the type of journalism that I was doing then, I did investigative journalism, but I was working at People, and they, they want access journalism. And access journalism was, um, especially on election night, when in Little Rock, when everybody knew that Bill Clinton was gonna be the president, the, those of us who were dispatched down there were like, your job is to get as close to the room as you can get where he is standing when they tell him he's president. That was my, those were my marching orders. So, and I was working with a photographer. So that morning, so I went to, we went to Little Rock and that morning a friend of mine, uh, who's also a photographer, 
was basically like a Clinton groupie. I mean, she never met him, but she just thought, oh my God, he's going to be elected. Are you staying in a hotel down there? I'm going to fly. She was in California. I'm going to fly there. Can I stay in your hotel and hang out with you? Because I want to see this amazing thing, this baby boomer president, right? Because it was a big deal when he got elected as a, ch as a kind of a, a, an era that was changing, supposedly. So she was there, and this is my buddy, and we went to breakfast in the hotel restaurant and we're eating and she I guess I left the room or something and I came back and she said she said oh no I know we were sitting at the table and and all of a sudden we started talking to these people at the table next to us and they said yeah we, yeah that's great we're Bill's cousins and we're visiting from you know and we're visiting from somewhere else in Arkansas and we're Bill's cousins and it's just great and we think he's going to get elected and and my friends, like, they're Bill's cousins. And I'm like, you know what? Everybody here today is Bill's cousins. Like, I don't have time for this. I got to go talk to Carville and Stephanopoulos and make sure they let me in that room. So I left her, and I went off on my, my job. And I went, you know, as, and, and as the, you know, when you're covering that kind of an event, the president, as, as it became clear that he was going to be president during the day, because these exit polls are showing, and everybody knows in advance, pretty much in an election like that, he was going to be the president. The access to somebody like that, that person in that area, of the, of even that area of a town, starts to lock down big time. So, you know, I'm still trying to get, I'm like, I got Stephanopoulos, I know those guys, I'm going to meet them, and they're like, yeah, we'll let you in. And then I couldn't even get even anywhere near the door, and pretty soon the photographer and I are like, standing outside and it's freezing freezing cold and now it's like 10 o'clock and he's been elected and we're wandering and there's fireworks going off and we're nowhere near anywhere near the the president-elect we're watching them with everybody else the riffraff right so or not the riffraff the people who elected him and we're the riffraff for sure so <laughs> so then i go back into the hotel and it's 11 o'clock at night i'm like completely defeated and I go up the elevator and up in this 11th floor of this hotel and the elevator opens up and there's my buddy stumbling out with her arm around Virginia Kelly. And she sees me and she goes, oh my God, I've been trying to reach you all day. And then, oh, this is before iPhones, right? So there was no like, and she goes, I left you so many notes on the bed in the hotel. It's very, she goes, and then she grabs Virginia and she goes, Virginia, this is the journalist I've been talking to you about all day. She needs to talk to you. And Virginia's like, had, you know, 20 gin and tonics or something. And she's like, honey, honey, I can't. And she stumbles off to bed. And my friend is like, I have you know, I go back to the room and there's this, there are like 10 notes on the bed. Anyway, that was my first um, experience of many failures that I would have in terms of access journalism. So uh, I just tell you that story because it's, it's funny. And I never did really get to meet Virginia, although I did spend time around Hillary. Um, so that's one of the, yeah, so that's access journalism. And that's now, now I moved to, oh, and I forgot to say, when I moved to Washington, one of the interesting things was going back to that is that Nobody was talking about this thing that I saw in Illinois. And once you're, if you're coming into Washington like I was from the sticks, and I was a kid, even though I really wasn't, I was already 30, now I'm giving away my age, I was older, I was still very cowed by the voice of authority that other people spoke with, and nobody would listen to me, or I felt like they didn't, and I, I never ran into anybody who even thought about this. There were a lot of things going on in, in Washington and a lot of bills being passed and discussions being had. And, you know, Hillary was trying to pass the health care. Uh, she was given the job of the health care re overhaul, well, creating a health care program that never got through. Um, but they, this was just not, you know, ever something that was an issue, really. Um, so, anyway, we wanted access to these guys. We didn't get them. I did end up covering covering a lot of Clinton, and then I'm going to fast forward now. I'm fast forwarding, so just think you're like, you're like in, um, 
It's like the twilight zone where it goes because a lot of things happen between Virginia Kelly and this period in time and I don't have time to tell you all about them. I did a lot of interesting and fun things and I got married and had some kids and um, wasn't covering politics that much and then 2015 comes and my uh, an editor at Newsweek, which was reconstituted, it had disappeared into digital world, and then they were trying to make it a print, bring it back in print, and bring it back to life. And editor called and said, "Do you want to cover the election in 2015?" And I thought, "Yeah, man, that would be kind of interesting because even though I don't really get along with her, I think that, and we can talk about that later, or not at all. Actually, it's not that important. Um, I had not a great opinion of her." Um, but I thought, it's going to be cool to watch the first woman president get elected. So yeah, I'll take that job. But I want to only do it for a year, and then you got to give me a job, like let me go back to the Mediterranean and have the Italy beat, because I don't really want to stay here. <laughs> so I started covering the election, or the campaign, in 2015 and 2016. And, um, well, everybody knows how it played out. But uh, what the way it, I experienced it was I was supposed to be covering her, but I was based in New York. So I ended up spending a lot of time around the other guy. Um, and I was in Trump Tower um, for a lot of press conferences and I covered his appearances around Long Island where he had lots of fans. And he was very interesting to watch in the beginning. We knew him, if you had, anybody who covered anything and I mean in the New York media world we knew him as somebody that you could call up for a really silly quote and that's how we treated him early on like I used to, when I worked at people you could call him up and he would say something outrageous and um, so in the, in the beginning you didn't take him that seriously I can tell you about how that played out my understanding of him evolved over the period of uh, early in 2016 um, but I just want to move forward to November 3rd, 2016. Everyone here probably remembers where they were. Maybe now it's all sort of like been fuzzed away. But to me, that was like a date. To me, people remember it like 9-11 or if you're really old, like JFK assassination. It was like a major day, right? So... I'm going to tell you about my day because, again, I was in a situation where we wanted, we thought she was going to win. I mean, I did think it was possible that Trump was going to win um, until the Billy Bush tapes. And then I thought, no way, it's not going to happen. But I, I saw the appeal, and I saw the appeal because of the Illinois, the, time, the things that I understood about the Midwest and what was happening there. So, election day... I have, I am not going to have that thing happen to me that happened with Virginia Kelly and Clinton. I'm going to go, I know I had a lot of sources and connections to her, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get in there. I have the means, and um, I know the people. So, there's Hillary, obviously. The person next to her is um, a major, major, major donor to the Democratic Party and a major, major fan of Hillary's. Her name is Susie Tompkins Buell, and she had some connection to the Patagonia company, I think, for a while, and um, Esprit was her company, but she's, she lives in Marin County, and she's very, very a very, very big supporter of Hillary, and one of the big Democratic donors. So I had worked to um, cultivate her as a source for a while, and election day rolled around, and they're, you know, we're all in New York, and she's, she's in New York, and she says, you, you, um, you know, I can get you in to the room where she's going to be uh, when the, you know, one of the first places she will come when the election is called will be this apartment building where a lot of the donors will be. So here's my cell phone number, and... Uh, absolutely, you will. You know, you can come in and, and you'll get an interview with her. So I had the cell phone number. I'd kept in contact with her all day. I even went to like a party they threw for Hillary. She didn't show up, but a lot of her friends were there. And um, 
And so the day went by and evening rolls around and the Trump party was going to be in the Hilton, uh, New York Hilton on 6th Avenue in the 50s, 50th and 6th, I think, 54. And for some reason I thought, that's just going to be a more interesting place to be right now for, for a minute because I really kind of want to see them all lose and I want to see how they feel about it. And also, you know, i got to cool my heels because it's going to be quite, quite a while before they, I get that call from Susie Tompkins be able to come up be able to come over to the donor's um, apartment. So I'm hanging out in the, uh, in the bar in the Hilton with my colleague from Newsweek whose job was to cover Trump. And we were both kind of kicking around like, do we? and he wanted to be with Hillary for various reasons. And uh, we're like, who's gonna stay here and who's not? And meanwhile, we're not even paying attention. We're like having beers. And then I start getting texts from my friends going, what's going on? what's going on? And I look up at the TV and there's like, the graph has just gone like, and they're and I'm like, well, I don't know what's going on. I, I don't know. It's like nine o'clock or 9.30 or 10 at night. And that's, yeah, that's not looking good, right? So then I said, well, I gotta check in with, with um, Susie. So I text her and she goes, oh, you should come over here right now. Yeah, it's not looking good, but you know, we're, we're really hopeful. So I hop in a cab and I go over to this apartment and it's like, oh, I don't, it's like as big as this room. And then there are like other rooms even bigger. And if you, anybody's been to New York, like those apart, like you just don't ever see apartments like that. And that they were, it had many rooms and this great big outdoor terrace and the rooms were filled, the walls were covered with like Pollux and Warhols and I mean the wealth the amount of wealth in there and and the donors who were in there the gathering of the people that were in there it was all these Wall Street people and I mean you could probably have if you had like your FEC report you could have probably taught it up like 75 million or a hundred million dollars of donors into the Democratic Party in that room in that apartment and there were TVs all over, and uh, one major, major Democratic strategist outside sobbing when I got there, who I won't tell you his name because whatever. And he was saying, they're going to put us in jail. I never, I'll never forget it. They're going to put us in jail. And I, I was just like, what is, they're going to put us in jail. I never thought about it that way. But yeah, they have been saying lock her up from the Republican convention on, they obviously think like that. So anyway, so I hung about there uh, for at least another hour or two, Every, all the TVs, different TVs in different rooms, different people in diff different rooms, talked to them, um, the, you know, the mood darkened, 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 and pretty soon it was like one o'clock you know, the Hillary cupcakes, the cupcakes with Hillary's face on them were being like eaten and, or, you know, like, and there was, you know, here, eat some more of this because we all have to go home. And then finally, Susie was the person I knew best, said, I'm going home. Do you want, and I said, yeah, I want a ride. Uh, give me a ride to Sixth Avenue. So get in the car, go down to Sixth Avenue. And it was like, oh, I just want to say like the inside of that, party was like, has anybody ever read The Mask of the Red Death? It's like, it was like an Edgar Allan Poe story because they're in there and outside was like not good. And so I went out and I get off at 6th Avenue, up, upper 6th Avenue, and I'm going to go to, because I had the Trump press pass, but I'm walking down the 6th Avenue and I'm like, this is not, this is all different now. New York City does not look like this normally. 6th Avenue was lined with people with flags and drunk, and they were screaming, lock the bitch up, all up and down 6th Avenue. I've never seen anything like it. And you probably won't see anything like it again for a while, or maybe you will, I don't know. Um, so I put the press pass in the, it was very um, menacing, and I put the press pass into the, into the coat so that I wasn't a press person, and I walked through them, and all along the avenue there were, television cameras 
from Turkey and Japan and France and um, you know everywhere where people were awake and it was daylight and they were watching this on it live like this this crowd um, screaming and you know they were like the French you know they're like beaming in on the these spitting angry faces so I get through that and I go upstairs in the lobby of the Hilton and um, there is now the party room that earlier had been so somber with piles of red hats and nobody actually wearing one. Now it was a whole different ball game because as with, all, you know, as I just said, as soon as there's a president elect appearing, there is a lot more security. So TSA was there and they were checking everybody and, um, and I got through because I had the pass and I got in the room, in the ballroom, and I was there when, I'm not going the right way, um, when um, the band strikes up something, I can't remember what it was, I, I'm sure it's in my notes but I don't remember it now. And um, all of a sudden, everybody starts cheering. Everybody's wearing the red hat, MAGA hat. Everybody, they're so happy. Jubilation, um, shock, even on their side. It was three in the morning by now. And all of a sudden, the band strikes up, and there's cheering. Like, hmm, I don't see them, because I was right under the stage, because I wanted to see up close and what was going on. I had stationed myself, and it was Giuliani was over here, and Steve Bannon's parents were over there, and the whole, the whole masked ball, unmasked or something. I don't know how to. And they're all sitting there, and and you know they were, they were, in, they were joyful, and and they were cheering. I'm like, where is he? I don't see him. And then I realized everybody's looking up, and he had entered the room through this balcony um, at the top of the room, up of this big ballroom, and he was doing this like strut around the ballroom with his chin jutted out, and these gazelles following him, and, um, and they went around the top of the, of the ballroom, and then they came down the stairs, and then they um, took some, they came down the steps onto the stage, and I was eye level to their feet. And I'm looking at their feet and I'm thinking, and you can see, I have to get closer to their feet, I guess. You can see the shoes that they're wearing are, they're really hard to walk on. Anybody wear, any woman here has ever worn shoes like this? I mean, they're six inch spike heels and I'm, that's Melania's feet, and I, it's not that, actually, that she wasn't wearing those shoes. And I was standing there, and I was thinking, wow, like, Hillary, white pantsuit grandma, um, was about to be the president, and now it's, this is the, this is what is going to be the role model for women in America, um, tripping down this, these steps. And, and I thought, I looked at them, and I just thought, they have such rigor, like they didn't trip. They never even looked down. There, there's such rigor with these conservative women. And they came down the steps, and um, it was such a moment. And everybody remembers it, I'm sure. It was such a moment. It was such a sh surprise. And I thought, well, it is a surprise, but it kind of isn't. And I'll tell you one more little story about why it wasn't such a terrible shock and getting back to the misinformation, disinformation part of this conversation. Um, in, this is me with the truckers, the founders of the Truckers for Trump. Did anybody ever run into them? Did they ever truck around here with their trucks and their flags? Probably didn't come around because you'd have to take those semis over the mountain range and that wouldn't be wouldn't be something they do, but they do come up and down the high. Anyway, so the Truckers for Trump formed at some, some point in 2016, early, and they announced that in 20, in, it, for the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, 
the truckers for Trump were going to form a convoy and surround the city of Cleveland because they expected there to be a lot of violence. Now, that's another thing that you've probably forgotten if you knew about it, but when we went to cover the Cleveland Convention, um, CNN and the big companies were actually giving their staff like trauma kits and stuff because they really thought that there was going to be a lot of violence and there, there were more cops and military on the streets of Cleveland than there were protesters as it turned out. But it was a very tense thing. So in advance of this um, nomination, the convention, uh, I thought, well, um, truckers for Trump, who are they? That would be kind of interesting. And I found out that this woman, who I'm standing next to, um, was the founder. And she lived in California, and her husband was the trucker, and they trucked around. Well, there's their dog, but I'll tell you about the dog in a minute. Um, she was going to be part of this convoy, and they were going to drive the truck from California to Cleveland and be part of this convoy and also to protect Trump from, you know, Antifa or something that might come and try to attack him or take his nomination away. So I thought, well, that'd be, you know, that'd be kind of an interesting way to do a story. So I, I thought, well, maybe I should call and see if she'll take me in her truck and I could just do this story about being in a truck with the trucker, truckers for Trump going to the convoy, going to Cleveland to anoint Donald Trump as their candidate. So as it happened, I didn't get my act together with the, air, with the flight to get to California. There was too much going on. I was too busy, too many other things going on. I didn't get to it to talk to her until it was too late to get a plane ticket out to California. There was no way that I was going to get into the, the cab with her. So um, that was, I was not happy about that. I was sorry, but it wasn't, and so I, but I, so I called her up and I said, I had not talked to her at, I mean, she was agreeing to this, but I had not interviewed her yet. And I said, I'll just do an interview on the phone with you. So I get on the phone with her and I said, well, what's your story? What, what is it, why do you like Trump and what's the deal? Why do the truckers, what, what are the truckers for Trump? What is it all about? And she told me a story that to me explains everything about what has gone on with um, information in our country. She said, well, because she started off, you know, very, very friendly, um, working mother, executive secretary, had a child, one eight-year-old child with her trucker, for tr her trucker husband. They lived somewhere in Southern California. And she um, and her husband had, been, had decided that they'd started to hear that Obama was going to take evangelical Christian conservatives like them and put them in FEMA camps before the election. And so in order not to be on the wrong side of, in two different parts of the continent when that happened, they had a year before taken their kid out of school, sold their house, and she had moved into the cab of this truck with their kid and they were homeschooling the kid in the truck. And as you can see, the dog, too, is in the truck. I mean, the, the cab was huge. The cab is like an RV. It's gigantic with, bed, with a bed, bunk beds, and, and so on. And they, um, they had been doing this all year. She'd been just in the truck with him. And because they didn't want to be separated when Obama um, declared martial law and threw them into FEMA camps because they were conservative Christian and... And I thought, my first thought was, oh my God, I am so glad that I did not get that flight and get into that cab because if she told me that story while I was in the truck taking off from California, my brain would have exploded right there in the truck. Like, <laughs> I would have had to get out. I, like, and, and that was the first time I really encountered this totally parallel universe of information. 
where these people had made life decisions based on some source of information that was completely separate from anything I was ever writing about, reporting on, or interviewing anyone about. It was the first time I ever encountered that. And now, of course, we, um, we don't, that doesn't surprise us anymore. And, um, here, please go into, oh, that's, I'm, that should have been up high. That's the Confederate flag outside of, well, it's right 20 miles down the road from a Lincoln shrine. That was also part of the alternative information world. Um, and this is the last thing I want to say, and then we can get back to, I mean, this is actually where we want to get back to the conversation. What is journalism and what is fact? Um, uh, I'm not going to blame Zuckerberg um, for everything that happened here. Obviously, he's not uh, my favorite guy. He's kind of an icky, jerky guy, and he's doing a lot of things. That, but, you know, these guys made these platforms, and they enabled a lot of this. So, we getting back to journalism and what is a fact, I guess the, the other question is, do you, does, is this guy a publisher? And the fact is that he's not treated as a publisher. None of these guys are treated as a publisher, as publishers. They are not required by um, any law uh, to be liable for libel or slander um, the way that we are in, you know, our we write for newspapers or websites now. Journalism is treated differently, and yet this is where a lot of speech and information is being traded around. Um, so back to the question of what is a fact, what is fake news, what is journalism? I want to ask you to weigh in on this, but I will just conclude by saying it to me, the difference between fake news and news is one single thing. It's the correction. If you've ever seen Fox News run a correction, um, I'd like to hear about it. And these guys don't consider themselves publishers because they don't have to be. Um, because the law allows them to, um, it treats them this is what, how it was explained to me at one time. I've done stories about this. The way the law evolved about this, these platforms as publishers, um, when they started out, they were treated like if you have a pencil and there's like a, you know, somebody's company name on it, that kind of thing. Or, you know, skywriting. Like, they're not treated as um, under the law, they're not treated as, as kind of substantial information purveyors. So that concludes my part of this. I would love to hear from any of you about whether you have any more thoughts about what, you know, what should be done, what journalism is. Um, raise your hand. I open the floor. Peter? Um, I grew up in a time when the government was handing out licenses for people to broadcast things. Over the airwaves, all frequencies were controlled by the government. And long before that came the responsibility. Ch Cheney was able to remove mm -hmm. the constraints, um, which is, in my lifetime, the worst. Um, governmental action um, and, and is actually you can trace all the ails and, and disinformation we have today to Cheney's effort to change the law as far as broadcast is concerned. Part of my problem with Facebook and all those other platforms, the taxpayer paid for the infrastructure and the backbone of the broadcast system that they're using they may have no regard for the fact that the taxpayer and this democracy 
provided that platform for them that they're not paying for and they're not being honest and truthful with. And at some point, the, the argument of turning them into a publisher is too easy. I don't believe that Facebook is a publisher. I think they're a broadcaster. And if we could get mm -hmm. rid of Cheney's Law and turn them into broadcasters, as all of the networks and radio stations used to be, then I think we could get control over this nonsense that is put out so easily. When you're talking about when you're talking about Cheney's Law, are you referring to the um, the fairness doctrine? Correct. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it was Cheney. I didn't realize it was Cheney, but of course, yeah. It was the, Cheney. He was the great Satan until Trump well, came along. Well, Ch Cheney had that as a document four years before Bush was elected. He was working on it full time. He wanted to release the constraints of other media to combat the reality that was being put out. Walter Cronkite is spinning in his grave. Yeah, the fairness doctrine needs to be, needs to come back, but the whole dark money, we haven't even gotten into that, the Citizens United stuff, that's not gonna happen. Anybody else? Yeah. It seems to me that since the internet itself has come along, you know, <coughs> we used to have such a, you know, a narrow. Can you hold the mask? It seems to me that since the internet has come along, we're trying to grapple with how to um, verify. Whereas before we had newspapers and you know, your TV news, and that's where everything came from. Now, even if you were to get rid of Facebook, you have YouTube. So it seems to me that we're trying to figure out how to control and verify and regulate something that is, in my opinion at this point, it's a lost cause. The cat's so out of the bag. Run, exactly. It's run, it runs wild. And if Facebook goes away or Instagram goes away or even... YouTube goes away, there's just gonna be one more. So I don't know at this point how you start to regulate any of that at this point when anyone can get on the news or YouTube and say whatever they want to. And there's always gonna be someone who's gonna believe them. Right, well, the Peter um, bringing up the fairness doctrine is, is um, I mean, there is, that is one way to go about that. Um, the, other, the other way, is, um, you know, our kids are a lot more savvy than, at least than the, the consumers of Facebook, algorithm feeding, outrage, Nazi combining um, operations and conspiracy theories that are proliferating online, they're more savvy about the sources than the baby boomers are and the younger, the, let's say, you know, I, so I, I, I'm kind of hopeful about that, um, that I think it may sort itself out to some extent, but come to the next talk that I give next week because that's all about misinformation and why people love it love conspiracy theories so much. It's about the, the pandemic and what happened with the conspiracy theories and the vaccine and weaponized misinformation. Um, and I, I think you're right. I think that it is, it's Pandora's box is open with that. Yeah? I agree the problem is the internet. And that's ironic. The internet is a wonderful tool in many ways. But the problem is everybody's got their own damn facts. We used to have just a few sources that everybody more or less respected. It's not true anymore. They live, they, Republicans, live in their own universe. They never look at CNN or the New York Times or the Washington Post because those are socialist rags, you know? And I don't see any solution for this because the, uh, the inter internet is constantly more omnipresent. It's not going any way, away anywhere. It's just getting bigger. And the problem, I think, is just permanent now.
do you see any positive outcome from the Alex Jones settlement? Um, that seems like a pretty hefty number, a billion dollars. And does it send a message to other pundits and talking heads that might want, that are doing what he's been doing? Um, I do. I think that, um, you know, as I said, the young, younger people are savvier. And I think that we've just gone through a period where that kind of thing reached its apogee. And I mean, the, that you can, that you can say and make money off of this idea, you know, these ideas that, um, you know, somebody's, these children were child actors and so on. I think the Alex Jones verdict is going to have an effect. I also think, you know, the problem is the justice moves so slowly. I think the Dominion lawsuit against Fox News, eventually it's gonna drag, it could be years, but, but those people have a case and they're gonna win it. They are gonna win it. And then what's gonna happen? You know, that, that you know, the purveyors, the, the disseminators, the big disseminators of bullshit will have to pay and then they'll be pulling back on it. The problem with bullshit is, excuse my language, is that it takes a lot more effort to correct it. If you're me or you know a journalist and you've, you're confronted with you know these some of these things that are absolutely not true, um, you know like yeah, usually I stay out of it. But if I get on Twitter and every once in a while you'll see these influencers, they're paid mega influencers just spewing yesterday stuff about the January sixth. You know the here it's always oh, all Pelosi's fault and you know they were Antifa actors and. And um, it takes a lot to, to counter that because people, as he said, they want to believe what they want to believe. But I think, um, you know, you just can't give up. And I do think these lawsuits are effective. Yeah, I would add kind of what you're saying, that people don't like to be cheated. And so, yes, people are gullible. People fall for this stuff a lot. They like a big, loud, angry, talking head. But when they find out, they were scammed or cheated. That does help, you know. I think it does to help. help. Yeah. Them I mean, you would have thought, and I'm going to bring this up at the next talk because it's about the pandemic, the book I wrote about the pandemic and misinformation. But you would have thought that all of the deaths, um, the COVID deaths, and all of the lies that were told about it, and all of the lies about the vaccine, would have, uh, you know, woken people up, but. I mean, some of the biggest vaccine deniers are dying of COVID left and right, and there's not, you know, there's not a change. I mean, there, I think there has probably been a change at some level among those people. But okay. anyone else? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm 15, and um, I totally agree with you with the fact of, like, um, we are, like, I mean, we, we are a lot more tech savvy. And I think, cause in all reality, I don't think like a 15 or 16 year old is gonna look up and go to like Washington Post to look at a fact, but we are gonna open up like, maybe not Facebook, but like Instagram and all of that. And I think that we have gotten a lot better. Maybe one of my like kind of reasons for that is that I don't think that we've been like I mean, we haven't been alive that long, so we haven't been, like, groomed into, like, believing all of this bullshit that's in this world, and I think that that's, like, kind of why we're getting better at understanding and kind of nitpicking at uh, what's the truth and what's not. So. That's a really interesting explanation, and I appreciate you telling us that. I don't know why my kids are more savvy, but I know that they are, and, and it's because you're born into it, I think. Okay, um, outside of the cognitive dissonance that she mentioned, outside of the cognitive dissonance that she mentions, you know, the social programming, um, I wanted to ask you about the DARPA program, LifeLog, and how you think it affected Facebook and our consumption of data. The DARPA program? Um, uh, 
it was, it was ended in February 3rd, 2004, ironically one day before the launch of Facebook. Well, I've never heard of LifeLog. I don't know what it is, so I can't answer that. I do know that DARPA was involved in the creation of a lot of this. And, and I do know that Cambridge Analytica and those behavioral, um, sci, what, you know, the kind of the psyops that they were doing with, um, with you know, big data harvesting and, and sectioning people off into small groups of like, minded people and then and then finding ways to direct advertising to them was something that was connected to um, some of the National Weapons Labs. C Cambridge was definitely connected with. I don't know. That's an, I've not, I've not heard that, but I, that's an interesting, it's, I don't know. I would know. even say if you were to look at the CIA records, it would, it would prove the collusion and the involvement in the deep state or black money as you spoke of earlier, starting all social media. And, well. And then if you look at like what, in the 1940s they would call it memetic magic, but her, her generation would call them memes. And if you look at the social programming that it's become and the opinion forming so quickly through things like TikTok, their generation has changed the attention span of the, the American public down to 30 seconds. And if you're to look at everything that Facebook created and everything, even in the MySpace days, it was, it was integral. It was the core of social media was the CIA backing and the DARPA backing of LifeLog and the... Like well, I'll have to data. I'll have to look at look it up. I don't know um, what LifeLog is, but I I, 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 I certainly should. think that they were using that these um, you know the military um, would have an interest in understanding how to do this, and and they were using it, applying some of these things to other countries. So maybe they were applying to us. I don't know, well, I, but I do think that there is some. Um, you know, there, that there's a commercial reason why they allow this to go on, and it has to do with selling stuff to people. Uh, and that's why they allow this gigantic data harvesting to go on. Well, the only reason I brought it up is because every one of my elders that is asked is asking how to combat such a thing, right? How do I combat or verify these things, right? Um, outside of cognitive dissonance, it almost involves the dub double slit experiment. It almost absolutely has to. Because if we're to see through media and why we are, why it's controlled and why what we see in our scroll is much like you said with the, the, um, the core of journalism, the Washington Post and the, the things that people used to be able to lean upon the integrity of, that was dissolved through the creation of social media. It, 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 it dissolved journalism like that. And in, 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 in the integrity that her generation sees, she just told you, I would never go to the news for that source. I would go to IG, Instagram. Mm -hmm. That instant gratification and that shortened attention span that these apps have given us in a 30-year span has crumbled our, our, our ability for critical Well, that's thinking. for sure. There's a problem with the attention span. Um, I, I write a column for the local daily paper, and uh, after it's published, I put it on Facebook. So there's a difference there uh, in that when I write it and send it into the editor, if I say something libelous, there's a good chance that they will they will uh, edit it out and that they will take a look at it. But Facebook isn't going to look at that. On the other hand, if in my column I say something stupid, uh, which I have on occasion, <laughs> uh, they're not going to edit that because they have the belief that, that it's my words, not their words, that are being published. And that's what Facebook is saying in the first place, that it's, it's the people that are posting on Facebook, not Facebook itself, that's giving this message. 
Right, but the but you work for the Silver City Daily. I I'm, I don't work. For you them. write for them. I write. Um, I mean, yeah, but the Silver City Daily is responsible for printing. If you pr write something libelous, they will uh, have to pay for it. So they're responsible for it as the publisher, and that's the difference between them and Zuckerberg, because Zuckerberg is not responsible for libelous material. Now they've tried to go after them for facts, fact-based things to put little notices on, you know, lies, right. but it's meaningless. Well, if I if I wrote something libelous and it somehow got past the editor, and then it got on Facebook. Who would be sued? The editor? Yeah, the, I think I'm not paper? a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, oh, libel lawyer, but I think your publisher would be sued for it. So Facebook is not responsible for it's not in that category. And yeah, it's not a publisher. Well, okay. But I'm not a lawyer, so don't do it and then come back and <laughs> to make sure you talk to your editor first. Anyone else? Uh, just wanted to say first, thank you very much for your free talk. And uh, to the 15-year-old uh, young lady here who spoke a minute ago, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, a couple years ago, The Social Dilemma came out. Maybe a few years ago, there was a, a show, The Social Dilemma, and I remember watching it and taking our, our young kids and, or, I'm sorry, they weren't young. We are now empty nesters as of like a month ago. So we took them a couple years ago and sat them down and they watched it. And I remember afterwards them kind of going, we, we get this. We kind of see through that. I know that there's a fear about, you know, us maybe not being able to see it and comprehend this thing that's sucking us into it, but we see it. And then uh, about a couple weeks ago, I was, I went down to get a coffee at, at, at work and this young woman was working there and she was on her phone and uh, she said, uh, um, I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm on my TikTok. And I don't have TikTok yet. And it was a little concerning, the, the conversation. And I was going, hmm, I don't know how to have this conversation. I don't have TikTok. I don't know what you're doing. She said, well, sometimes I just find myself doom scrolling. You know, that's when I don't, I don't. But there's, there's this thing that comes up sometimes. And sometimes I'll, I'll learn news. You know, I'll find out about news. And she said, you could actually become kind of like your own journalist using this platform. And then people subscribe to you. And then you just reshare news. And I don't know what. The next, I mean, Mark, 20 years ago, whenever when he did this, you know, he was at Harvard, he was, he was really about money and making money and doing his thing, and I don't know if he ever knew how this thing would unfold, but I feel like there's going to be another Zuckerberg that comes out, and, and, you know, this young lady and other people in the next stage that come through and, and bring truth to light using a new platform and, and continue to share using the things that they've learned. So anyway, I just wanted to say thanks and share that. Oh, well, thank you, and... Um, I think you're right. I, I think that, you know, as this is a period of profound change, and that's why a lot of the stuff is going on. It's enormous. And it's like when the printing press was invented and started to be used, um, you know, people didn't know what to do. And now we have this really powerful connecting technology. And... Um, I think that in the end, it probably will be a used for good and for ill. But for sure, you know, she says she doesn't read Washington Post on Instagram, but um, for sure, those all of those sources are out there on those websites. You know, I see, well, I see, it depends on what you're following, but I think it filters out um, into, into TikTok, and, and um, they're all trying to be on those. I mean, Facebook is already passe. I'm, I'm, this is all, I put this up here because uh, it was such a force in the 2016 election. But now, you know, and 2020 to some extent. But now it's going to be a whole other, you know, the Democrats are fighting to get on TikTok right now. I just saw a headline about it, fighting to get messages onto TikTok. So they're, they're changing all the time. But you're right. I mean, I think, I don't, I don't agree that the Internet is a terrible thing. I mean, we li we're living with it now, and it's done all sorts of amazing things. You know, you would not be seeing the violence against a George Floyd if you hadn't got the internet. And there are lots of other things that are coming out that would are available for, you know, educationally. 
So. So you mentioned teaching at NYU. I'm just wondering what, from your perspective, what are new journalists, young journalists, how are they being trained differently or not? I mean, what's that next oh. generation of journalists? What well, I teach graduate school journalism there, so they're you know they're out of undergrad. There, there is a difference. Um, obviously, there's a difference in that they're. Um, uh, the site, the places where they can go to work, oh, they're different. You know, there aren't the state house press rooms like I had. They're, they're, it's a lot more remote, virtual reporting is more of a thing with them. And when I first went to this newsroom in Newsweek that they'd started up again, I was shocked at how silent it was. Because where we worked, we were yelling at the t all the time, and phones were ringing, and you're screaming at people and arguing with them, and nobody was talking because they're all emailing and. Um, so there's, that's a difference in, you know, the technology's different, obviously. Um, but the rules are the same. The rules are, you know, fact check yourself. Don't print stuff that you haven't checked out. Um, you know, I think the most interesting thing for me with my students in the recent years has been how difficult it is for them to write commentary because of this world, the climate that they've grown up in, and, and it's all about Twitter, you know, swarming, social media swarming, and it's, it's always hard for young people to step into their authority, but they, they have a hard time, like, making arguments, pointed arguments. As, and so what we do is we try to get them to write different kinds of articles. You know, they may not, you know, so try, you know, try a reported profile, try to go out and do a news story, send you over to you know, to go to the Met and write an art review, um, write a feature, you know, write a commentary, and every week they have to write something else. And so that's interesting. But no, they're, the rules are the same. And if you fact check, you fact check yourself, and if you make a mistake, you own up to it and fix it. You know, um, so that's, I mean, those are the differences. And in and, and the last couple of years, it was incredible because they were, the students were not even able to go out of their houses or apartments to go report. So now it's you know a little back to normal. But I wouldn't say it's that much different. The rules are the same. Are your students asking about the Maggie Habermans and, and those in journalism? And New York Times I'll point to specifically are they asking about her making money on this book? Or like, what does it mean? No, well, I, that she whole... She knew such a long time ago that Trump knew he lost this election. The New York Times also was a huge in building up to legitimizing the Iraq war. Are your students asking about that? No, I mean, the students, no. I, I'm not, I haven't had that conversation with them. This, this the book issue is, uh, is something that we, I was actually talking to the department chairman about it the other day because it's not just Maggie Haberman. Bob Woodward, Woodward, Woodward knew all, he knew that Trump thought the um, virus was deadly, right? Or something, I mean, they just hold on to this material until they can get their book published and uh, that's not cool. Um, I don't write those kinds of books. I know why they're doing it, but they have access and if they and if they have access and they're not um, releasing it, well, well, it's just it's it's just kind of shocking, yeah. But I mean, you know, that's the way it's been done for a long time, right? Woodward's been doing this forever, and all these books are like that. So, it's you know, there's a competition, it's money making, and then the Times and the Iraq War. That's a whole other conversation. We could have a whole room full of discussion about that. That's different. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was irresponsible. I mean, what's her name? Uh, Jill Abramson eventually admitted it was a terrible mistake to let Judith Miller, um, you know, grab, run with the story. And it wasn't just her, though. I mean, I remember when the Iraq War was starting and how hard it was to get a voice in edgewise, um, contrary. You know, once it started to march down that road, they jumped on, and 
and it was disgusting and horrifying to watch. And it's, you know, those little towns in the Midwest lost blood and treasure, and they nothing has been poured back in. And it's, you know, I mean, that's how you get a Trump. It's heartbreaking. It, that's the big folly. That that to, that is the beginning of the of the Trump era, really, in my view. Right. Yeah, no, I think the wars, they wasted a lot of money in, on them, a lot of cynicism. Anyone else? Yeah. I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on the Associated Press, because you started out with them, and what it's looked like to me is that they're all that's left. <laughs> that every story is being covered by the Associated Press, but maybe I'm misunderstanding what that really means, that it's not a lot of individual papers doing their own investigation or their own coverage oh, of stories. Oh, no, they're not the only ones that are left at all. Okay. They're great. Uh, it's a terrific organization. Um, by the Associated Press, you know, it's always yeah, like... Yeah, no, they're not the... Them. Yeah, I know what you're... Yeah, I know why you're saying that, too, because the small pa smaller papers don't have the resources and so they are using the Associated Press. I know what you're saying now. Yes, that's true. Um, but that's what the Associated Press always was. Um, it was a consortium of newspapers. And the, the newspapers pay for it. And then the, some of those newspapers, if they do their own um, investigative piece, that might go up on the AP wire, or I don't know what they call it now, but they you know, they, they put it on its web, their website. They would, they would disseminate it. Um, but there are, there are other organizations that are terrific investigative organizations, like McClatchy. Um, Politico. Yeah, Politico's doing all right. Salon, you know, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, they're not like the AP. The AP is like, you know, Reuters. and Reuters and Bloomberg. And AFP, BBC, yeah, there, there are lots of, and the Silver City Daily, darn it. I think you're lucky that you have a daily paper here. I'm so impressed. Four times a week? Okay, well, that's pretty close. Better than a weekly. Anyone else? Well, I just want to thank you all for coming out. I really was told that there would only be about 10 people here. So I'm super, super great, grateful. And I hope that it was interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was a fabulous interview. Off to the toad session. for karaoke. Um, two, two quick things. Nina's second talk, part two, storytelling versus misinformation, will be hosted by the Southwest Word Fiesta next week, Wednesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m. in the GRC auditorium and also on Zoom. And out in the lobby, there are copies of Nina's books for sale. So thank you all for attending and see you next week. <laughs>